Good morning, everybody, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honored and very pleased to uh, continue the yesterday uh, discussions with a discussion with uh, what I could easily call the, the most famous name in Romania when it comes uh, when it comes to blockchain. So, um, Benny, good morning, and welcome to Bucharest. Good morning, Andre. Good morning, guys. Uh, really great to be here and have this conversation. Yeah, just 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 chit chatting a bit in the opening. Uh, how often are you in Bucharest? I mean, you're based in Sibiu, right? Yeah, but uh, I'd say every two weeks, every week, sometime. But uh, usually, very very uh, quick, just in and out, maybe one day. So uh, yeah, whenever it's needed, we're here. But Sibiu is definitely a place where um, it seems like mo more people from Bucharest are slowly moving, so we'll see. Then, then, then again, I'm not even sure when it, when it comes to, uh, to blockchain, is it fair to say that uh, a blockchain company is headquartered anywhere? Because my perception is, you know, you, you guys, the players in this area, are, are actually literally global. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, the, the whole idea is that the network is geographically distributed in many parts of the world with a community that spans many, many countries. Um, and um, part of the team is in CBU and part of the team is um, around the world. But um, I, I guess during the next period, we're probably going to um, have both offices and larger communities expanded in, um, in other countries and just um, take this step further to um, not only have the communities, but then big, bring some strategic adoption in, um, in these relevant countries that, that we see have a tremendous potential. Makes, makes sense. And uh, you, you've already done a number of acquisitions in Romania and, uh, and abroad. And from what you're hinting, this may continue, or you're just thinking about growing the, the team let's say. Um, in, in, in any case, uh, you mentioned about spurring adoption, and uh, I've, I mean, we interacted uh, first time a couple of years ago, and uh, I, I, I knew a number of things about uh, cryptocurrencies, but I haven't had met at the time a lot of people, let's say, in this, in this area. And I was amazed about, uh, let's say, your focus on clarifying points and then Later on, we discussed a lot about education and clarifying concepts. And, and, and that's probably one of the things that not generally the world needs, but the world when it comes to crypto or blockchain needs, right? So there are a lot of concepts flowing, floating around, uh, many times not with a lot of clarity. And, and just picking on yesterday, yesterday it was, there were a lot of discussions about um, CBDCs. Yeah? And maybe I take the opportunity today with, with you being here to, to take a step back more towards like, uh, uh, you know, first principles based, of re based reasoning. And, okay, CBDCs are another form of money. Um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would just raise the ball for you uh, in terms of maybe opening an angle on money in general and what how could digital money change what we know about money, which would mean change what we know about the economy, right? Um, so I, I do believe that in whatever we do, the idea of first clarifying um, what it is that's the, the essence of what we're discussing about is very much worth it. And there seems to be quite a mental confinement when it comes to thinking by analogy. So uh, thinking by analogy is very useful for people because it's mentally easy and then you can immediately grasp an idea by its analogy. But when it comes to thinking hard, the scientific method starts by reasoning from first principle precisely because this is how you usually make the big discoveries. This is how you usually can clarify the different things and then move forward. And so when it comes to money, it seems that 
we usually discuss a lot of details, but do not clarify the fundamentals uh, and think a lot about the fundamentals. So it's interesting to think that everything we know around money can be boiled down to um, sort of four um, key or core elements. And those are unit of account, um, medium of exchange, store of value, and the idea of, of debt. Um, it almost seems like everything we have is just a derivative of one of these elements. And so coming back to your point, um, it seems that when people talk about money, they usually talk about one of these elements. Um, and each of them implies different, um, let's say, performance optimizations. Each of them implies some things that matter a lot and other things that don't necessarily matter. So um, when it comes then to CBDCs, um, it's clear that this would be a medium of exchange. Um, you can, of course, discuss a medium of exchange in absence of the, let's say, government or banking system and so forth, principally. Um, but then you can also discuss it in a way where you see what's the optimal version that could function um, immediately given the current system. Um, and I do think that if we look at a medium of exchange, the ideal or optimal version should be a currency that is relatively stable, um, a currency that can be moved almost instantly um, anywhere in the world, inexpensively, um, and then is accessible ideally to, to the majority of the population. And whichever network can be the premise for building such a currency, whichever technology can be the premise of building such um, a, a currency, uh, those will very likely win because at the end of the day, um, what we've had with a, let's say, analog, more analog version of, of the fiat uh, version of money was a first iteration of this type of idea. Now, even if you would take something like the, the euro and make it digital, or you take something like the, the dollar and make it digital, or the ron and make it digital, the idea of just having that in a way that's instantly transferable at a trivial cost um, anywhere in the world between any uh, type of people and uh, merchants, that in itself accelerates the entire flow of money. The idea of velocity of money would uh, move, uh, accelerate probably with either one or two orders of magnitude just as a function of being able to, to do all of that. Um, but then there's also a discussion uh, with a slightly different conclusion, which is, um, is there a version of medium of exchange that could supersede what we currently have with the, with the state, with the banking system, or be the subject of a, let's say, superstructure for the banking system? Something, what, what comes after the dollar? and the euro would be the question. Is there some currency that would be native to the internet and that would not be necessarily a store of value but a, a very, very effective medium of exchange? Well, it's almost like if you look from the future back, this can hardly go on without um, us creating something like that. So um, I, I do believe that this is what we're discovering and looking for. Um, something that would be much more effective than what we have uh, with the dollar and, and the euro uh, and might be a combination, aligning forces even between them. I mean, when I hear you saying that, I'm, 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 you know, the natural question that would come from, from a lot of people would be, what would such a currency be backed by? Yeah, because we, we are thinking in those terms. Mm -hmm. uh, but even more, I mean, you, you described the key features of money. 
You omitted one, however, which is specific to, um, to money, broadly speaking, or to legal tender in particular, which is that money are accepted, are supposed, and they have to be accepted at face value. Which means if I have a one, one dollar bill, mm -hmm. it says one dollar, I cannot dispute it's one dollar. Mm -hmm. yeah? Now, interestingly, in the world of cryptocurrencies, you know, we, we don't discuss about that. Yeah? I mean, there are Bitcoin maximalists which are saying one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, right? But what does it, that exactly mean? We're still valuing cryptocurrencies by reference to a fiat currency. So my, my question would be, how could a currency which, the value of which is always referred by reference to a fiat, still be a currency? This is, um, this is a good point in that a good reference point for um, us making the next step in the evolution of, let's say, finance and money and so forth will be just us flipping the switch. So whenever um, people discuss about things, if they start discussing in, let's say, Bitcoin terms of or eagle terms and and so forth um, at that point um, It would essentially make them rethink what they're paying for because um, Even though I've mentioned uh, currency a fiat currency being relatively stable We know that this kind of stable comes with a lot of asterisk points uh, meaning that it's stable relative to something that based on inflation it can be quite unstable um, that in some countries this experiment has failed tremendously and uh, like uh, we've seen has, has burned quite, quite a large amount of the population. So um, I guess the, the key point here would be much more what would trigger such a shift in perception or discussion where everything would start being referenced to this new standard, uh, rather than us discussing it via, via fiat. And I do understand why most of the people um, discuss it uh, through this lens. It's, it, it's almost a very damaging reinforcing feedback loop. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like, you have this instant feedback loop that feeds on you, reminds you about really bad things. Uh, the, with, with the manic depressive nature of the market, you don't usually um, end up in a good position. So if you can switch to this uh, longer term idea, escape this conversation that happens on a daily basis with the irrationality of the market and so forth, at that point you can already do the switch in, in your mind. And um, I do believe that we need a critical threshold of user adoption for us to actually be able to make the switch in a meaningful way. But once we might see it done by some of the large companies, like let's, let's say Musk does a joke about it and, and start pricing whatever car, cars or something else in digital currencies, in Dogecoin, for instance, uh, that would be both a joke and uh, a very strong point to people starting to consider things. And, and, and you're right in terms of adoption uh, is not yet there. Adoption by mindsets, I mean, uh, but, but still things are happening. I mean, I, I, again, one of the surprises I, 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 you know, was for me when I started working with people, with companies in this ecosystem is to find out that we have companies that actually enjoy being paid in cryptocurrencies, all sorts of cryptocurrencies. And moreover, there are employees <laughs> that want to be paid in cryptocurrencies, at least partially or sometimes fully and so on. So at least some segments of the economy, because this is part of the economy, are no longer really benchmarking versus fiat, but versus a, a, a certain cryptocurrency. And then we look backward, I think we had the, the Libra uh, slash DM attempt, like right? initially the idea was that that's, the, 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 the Facebook crypto would be backed by a basket, I think, of cryptocurrencies. So again, was not benchmarked to fiat, yeah. which maybe that's what raised the rage of the Fed and, send, and the banks and so on, because they probably just realized, given the, the huge network power of Facebook, that you know, something big 
could be happening in, in the matter of money. Yeah? Um, so some things are, are in a way uh, uh, happening. And, and how, I mean, do, do you think the whole metaverse discussion and evolution could play a role into that? Uh, because once we talk about metaverse, then it's like pretty much everything is digital. And the idea of using a digital native currency in a digital environment kind of, you know, makes sense. Um, yeah, so coming to your first point, I would say that uh, what we identified um, as a very important critical threshold would be one billion people usually, um, not, not usually, but joining the space. So if one billion people have crossed the boundaries, um, have joined the space, at that point, uh, the space might probably um, be at a point where the, this type of crypto or digital economy will eclipse the, the traditional economy. So at that point, it will probably become like a much more general reference point for, for the other people as well. And I would also say that there is a very important point here that um, although it's o always useful to think really hard about technologies, about investments and, and so forth, and make um, the right kind of decisions, calculated decisions. Um, it does seem like in startups especially, um, people, once they understand a certain type of technology, they understand that if the impact it proposes comes to fruition, there is an upside there that's uh, fundamentally incomparable to what they would gain um, if they would keep the, let's say, normal or traditional reference point. So this is why they, they want to be in, this is why the partners want to be in and, and all of that. And to, to the extent that this works at a larger and larger scale um, and the adoption effects come in, um, you, you see a trend emerging that is sort of much more powerful than the natural inertia that you have in the current system. So this is, this is how I usually think that it happens because you have different forces and as long as you have stronger forces that are emerging, um, that are capturing the, the minds of, of uh, different people and bringing a lot of value and adoption, um, at that point you'll, you'll see uh, this coming um, happening a lot faster. Now, you, you also mentioned a point about what a currency is backed by, and then if there's an idea of um, having a stable currency, what's the optimal version of backing it? And um, there are several discussions here. Let's say the, the obvious and uh, orthodox discussion is just backing it one-to-one -one with fiat. Uh, that's the, the simplest thing, and of course, it can be a good step forward just uh, by demonstrating the possibilities that the technology brings without having to debate any kind of, um, let's say, technical discussion, risks, and all of that. But then you can also move a lot further with either a basket of assets or a basket of currencies a basket of, of assets, a basket ideally of non-correlated assets. Um, and then uh, you can also make it uh, much more, um, uh, let's say, um, ambitious if you're going toward the crypto direction uh, with potentially um, either backing it with a basket of, of cryptocurrencies or a basket of um, um, combination between traditional assets and, and you, cryptocurrencies. You, you know that on this point is very easy to raise the, 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 the recent argument of Luna, right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, and and I, I would say that um, here the, there's something that usually people discount when something like this happens, namely that building an algorithmic stablecoin is extremely complex. So most people do not understand the problem that this type of system comes with. And the fact that irrespective of how smart, determined, and resourceful all the people up until this point have been, 
no one has succeeded to create one that um, withstood the shocks and risks that the market brought. So this is a super strong point to think about whenever you're, uh, you're thinking of building a, a, an algorithmic stablecoin. But then um, the idea of the algorithmic stablecoin is essentially twofold. Can you create a system that is robust enough in sustaining or withstanding any type of risk that would come within the market? And here, any type sounds too vague because any type would definitely not qualify. Whatever you're building, there needs to be some very specific assumption there. Um, and here is where the flaw of, of the Terra and Luna system lay, that it, has, it had some specific assumptions that were not made obvious. The whole point being that, for instance, whenever someone says that Bitcoin is secure, they, they're actually saying that um, if you assume that no one can buy more than 51% of Bitcoin, which is quite difficult and, and so forth, then Bitcoin would be secure. In the case of Luna, again, there were some very precise security assumptions mentioning that um, if the system that not, does not collapse um, beyond a certain point, everything can be recovered. Mm -hmm. But if the system goes beyond that point, no one thought, apparently, what would happen, what would be the consequences, and so forth. And uh, when, when it happened, um, they did not react correctly. They did not stop the system. The, the three days that they waited for killed them 10 times just because it, it made the situation a lot worse. And even when they restarted the system, instead of saying, let's cut one arm, but save the, the body as difficult, painful, and so forth as it is, they made the wrong decision of basically letting everything flow. And then the, the basis of their blockchain, which was the Luna, Luna currency, going to, to zero, and then them having no chance at all. So, this is super difficult to solve. It was, in some sense, um, a very interesting experiment. Too bad that it failed, let's say, at this point, where there was so much exposure in the market by, by different people and, and so forth. Ideally, these experiments fail much more early. Uh, and then you learn the lessons and, and um, find either a better solution or go a completely different path. To me, to me it's interesting uh, how the example of Terra Luna Collapse is uh, used by what we call mainstream media as an example or why, of why crypto is bad, crypto is a scam, it induces systemic risks. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm old enough to have been around and worked for, for banks and borrowers in the previous financial crisis. And, the previous financial crisis, uh, you know, Lehman Brothers collapse and so on, and and uh, Fed intervening with TARP, Trouble Asset Relief Plan, and and that was because of innovation in financial sector. It was started with asset-backed securities and with a number of wrong assumptions and and people thinking that they are you know uh, smarter in assessing risk and not foreseeing an event which, in retrospect, looks yeah. A, a real estate market can also go down, yeah? and that's what they didn't they didn't factor in, yeah, because it has been going up for for a number of years. So all derivatives uh, collapsed. So my my point is, you know, yes, we have big collapses in the in the blockchain slash crypto sector, uh, but but the financial sector has been, you know, the traditional financial sector has been the source of the biggest financial collapses in the history of the of the mankind yeah so it's kind of natural once you experiment experiment once you innovate you develop new instruments there's also risk in there and and, and that's one one example of of, of those uh, Benny, we, we, we discussed, uh, I think we, 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 you know, we, went, we started from CBDCs and we kind of ended up with stable coins, right? If I, if I, I look at, at what we've discussed, if, if you'd be to come up with an idea about, I mean, there are many applications of, of crypto in general, right? So people are talking, and I'm talking now applications, you know, at private level, at business level, but also at state level, right? So there are discussions at state level, obviously, of CBDCs, that's 
you know, monetary policy of a state. Uh, there are discussions about um, digital identity on blockchain, uh, property transfer, I mean property transfer from the physical world via, I don't know, tokenized property, blockchain, and so on. Um, now, metaverse is coming into play, a new, a brave new world, let's say, with its uh, um, um, promises, but also, you know, maybe risks. If, if you'd be to, to, to take one application of, of blockchain, uh, be it cryptocurrency or not, that you think would have the biggest impact if a state would, would adopt it? What, what do you think that would be? Um, you can give two. Yeah, yeah. I, I would start by saying this, that um, in fact, there are two fundamental problems that once solved will make this um, idea around blockchains finally usable at scale. And those two, two problems or challenges are um, dial up to band, high bandwidth um, transition. This is, this is why we built Elrond. This is why we believe it's extremely important to have this transition. It's like in the early days of the internet, unless you moved away from dial up and had the, the high bandwidth uh, part, um, you, you would not have all the applications we have today. You'd be still stuck. And then the second part is a huge UX paradigm shift. Because um, for as long as people have to learn about blockchain technology, for as long as um, they still discuss the things instead of using the technology and seeing its benefits, um, it's, still, it's still going to be a challenge. Um, this, is, this is why we built um, Myar. Now, moving one step further, I do believe that for a state at this point, um, if you would think about the highest impact, lowest cost, most non-controversial thing possible that would uh, move the entire blockchain space forward, but then would also potentially move the state that would um, adopt this technology forward, would, this would be definitely a CBDC. So a stable coin based on blockchain technology that inherits the properties of, of a very advanced network, like the Elrond network, for instance, and then um, puts the digital version of their fiat currency um, on top. Why would this be very useful? Of course, it would just make things, as I was uh, saying before, almost instant um, at a trivial cost, transferable, um, accessible to almost anyone. Um, and then this would, as an effect, make the cost of doing business, the cost of doing and offering the different services, the cost of exchanging everything uh, much smaller, much simpler, and would accelerate, in fact, the entire economic process and, and growth process. But this, this does seem a bit boring because it's super obvious. Um, I mean, we're, it's not like we're discussing something uh, very new here. There is a lot of discussion, and I'm, I'm quite curious and happy to see, uh, both to see the next steps that the states are, are coming up with, and I'm happy to see that there's a lot of progress, and that this might be a lot um, more useful than what we currently have with fiat money. Now, maybe changing the perspective a bit and taking something much more longer term with, I believe, incomparable implications for both individuals, companies, organizations, and states. Um, the idea of the metaverse, I do believe, um, has not been understood correctly. So when, when people discuss the idea of the metaverse, they usually understand very, very different things. And because they understand very different things, maybe they think about cartoons that people play right now, or um, they think about Ready Player One environments, um, they don't necessarily see this as what it is, and then what it could become at different stages in, in the development. And maybe a, a useful way of thinking about this is um, 
understanding that this is essentially just technology um, making the inter interaction a lot more, let's say, um, useful, exciting, interesting, and, and so forth. This is the basis of it. Um, and then its effect can, can go in very different directions. Um, fundamentally, I believe that the, this new language of expression that we'll have is very similar to writing, in that writing put um, humans on a very, very different trajectory. It changed their brains um, and then allowed them to store the state of what they learned and so forth without having the reset every generation. Um, and then with the printing press, it almost seems like the entire world um, accelerated tremendously. You, you could almost make the point that the uh, um, industrial revolution um, has come as an effect of the printing press being built. Now, I, I do think that we're now at the point where with this technology, things could get so exciting and so weird at the same time that um, for the first time we might have a new language that is incomparable in expressiveness, preciseness, um, and th this type of fundamental nature that it could alter everything. Um, and in, in what way I'm saying this, um, you could think of it in terms of any type of thing that we're currently doing as humans. Uh, whether it's adventure, exploration, learning, um, uh, working, all of that, uh, pleasure, all of that can take a form that is incomparably more intense, interesting, and exciting. It's almost like thinking about the in intensity of TikTok, which is very dialed down. I mean, it's, it's not full intensity, but then applying that to learning. If you could have that type of state of mind where you're almost in fight or flight mode, um, super engaged, super focused, and then could learn with um, um, more w most well-equipped people that have lived throughout history. You could meet them for a conversation in Athens, in Rome, whatever uh, the place would be. How would the life be? How would you learn Def and remember the Definitely things? super interesting, but, but in the same time, the, 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 the passion with which you talk about these things, and you know, I, I kind of visualize as you describe them, is also making them <clears throat> a bit scary, yeah? because such a world would also be so much interesting that we may not want to leave it anymore. Sure. And, and I'm sure it's going to raise its own, its own problem, but definitely uh, we're heading you know, I, I, I think that's what you're saying. We're heading towards a mind shift <clears throat> in terms of how, you know, how life is being lived, right? Um, <clears throat> as as um, uh, I'm also a bit conscious of time, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to bring the discussion, let's say, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to an end. And um, just, just a couple of, of questions. One is um, how... How do you personally perceive, I mean, again, coming back to blockchain and blockchain-based companies, you, you guys are literally addressing yourself to a global market. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you started from a certain you know, point in Romania, and uh, then you became famous. Uh, you already have investors. Uh, uh, you made public investors from US and so on. Um, so you, you wonder, I mean, we had discussions about, you know, tax aspects, legal aspects of operating from Romania. How do you make a decision when you're in such a position and you're considering that, that the project you work on is supposed to expand exponentially and globally? How do you make a decision to continue to operate from Romania? While there are various jurisdictions which are actually positioning themselves proactively as being attractive from Dubai to Switzerland and so on. Sure. I would still close a point on, on the metaverse part, which, um, um, which I'd say is definitely going to be super challenging. Namely, how do we make it such that this technology 
um, does not become a thing where you're, you're really in a dystopian state that you cannot evade and it's much too addictive to, to manage and uh, all of that. And how do we bring the effects back into this world so that we can create a, a positive feedback loop there? Um, but coming to, to this point, um, the idea is, I believe, uh, at different stages, very different. Um, but at our stage, it's extremely important that, uh, surprisingly, in Romania, um, despite a lot of in infrastructure, let's say, um, sectors being pretty messed up um, and, and um, not, not very helpful, um, the technology infrastructure is surprisingly well positioned, especially the internet speeds and performance and so forth that we have, I would say is by far the most important thing that we have and that we can benefit of. Because without the internet, um, I'll be very clear and very honest, we would not have this conversation and a lot of other conversations that are super interesting and so forth. Um, so, given that we have this type of technology, given that there are um, a very large number of super smart, super resourceful people, I believe this is where the uh, opportunity is for Romania. Um, and it's almost like wherever you look, you can improve things. This is the interesting part of having a broken system. Wherever you look, these things could really be improved tremendously. Um, in terms of Elrond and, and our positioning, we've always taken two types of approaches. We've been on the one hand very pragmatic. If we would see that um, there is a clear obstacle to us continuing to function and move forward and building uh, what we're trying to build, we would definitely immediately consider uh, moving and consider repositioning ourselves in order for us to be able to continue to, to execute on, on the plans and, and vision that we have. Um, up until this point, this has not been the case. Quite the contrary, um, it's almost, it almost seems like whatever problem or challenge or obstacle you're starting up with, if you can withstand it, that can become your, your most important advantage. Uh, and, and so, uh, interestingly enough, we're, we're joking that uh, the, the, the area in Sibiu is very different than, than you'd expect. The environment has some opportunities, but it's also interestingly focused. So you don't have a lot of distractions. Uh, and this makes it uh, a very good environment for building stuff, for not losing energy and, and all of that. Of course, whenever you want to travel, you can travel the world and, and so forth. But I would say, first, if you can survive and build things, you can definitely exist there. We're considering definitely um, having um, larger communities, HQs in different countries of the world, just because it's extremely important. But I, I, I would also say that we're past the point uh, where we see ourselves only in some particular location, as like us considering that we're uh, Romanians and uh, thinking a lot about this part. It's, it's more like, this is what we have to do. Does the environment enable us to do this or allow us to do this? If it does not, or if it would not, then we would immediately consider some other options. And then if at different stages we find that there's a tremendous opportunity out there in opening new offices and um, moving part of the team or creating new themes in some other places of the world, um, we'll, we'll definitely consider that. And we're actively considering it in, in some locations. Um, but I would end with this part that the first and foremost thing that a state should probably do is not create obstacles, enable people to, to experiment, to innovate, to create new technologies, because this is the one thing that brings the economic growth that the state should desire most, more than anything else. And if this exists, then of course the people have a better life. Um, 
better jobs, better um, environments and, and so forth. There's also a case for protection and, and all of that. But as long as this is done in a smart way, you'll see many, many experiments. And even throughout history, this is uh, how the interesting people that have built interesting technologies have chosen different countries. If they saw that their countries would suffocate whatever they were building, they moved to other countries. If they were left alone to, to just pursue that, uh, the countries benefited tremendously. Um, and um, yeah, I, I hope this is just the beginning of a, a larger chapter that we'll see. So what I take is uh, you guys as entrepreneurs uh, from the IT environment, but I think generally entrepreneurs do not really like or do not need the paternalist type of state who takes care of everything because that is actually the source of overregulation. And in a way what you're saying is let us be, let us develop, do not hinder uh, you know, what is ultimately uh, good and, uh, and progressive for the, for the society. And, uh, and then, you know, we'd love to be here. And if I would be a journalist, I would take as a tagline what, what Benny Minku just said. I would say, Benny Minku from Elrond, billion dollar uh, market cap cryptocurrency creator, uh, just said that CBU is better for um, IT uh, development than um, uh, Dubai. <laughs> not then to buy, actually, because actually your options are global, sure, actually, sure, are, not, sure. are not national, so I'm sure you've got proposals sure. to move into those locations sure. and so on. They, they love to do that with, uh, with blockchain companies. I think, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking for, for, for Sergio, uh, but I think we are uh, uh, towards the end, right, of our, of our discussion. Um, thank you very much, Benny, for, for the interesting chat. I think, actually, we've discussed a number of points, but there are the discussion opened a number of other points, and it's, a, it's a, something that uh, cannot be addressed fully in a half an hour discussion. But uh, anyway, thanks a lot, congrats for everything that you're doing, and uh, we'll be following you in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys.